हेलो बलाजी सर इसमें वॉइस ऑडिबल टीम हेलो बालाजी सर इसमें वॉइस ऑडिबल ना हेलो हाँ मैडम एक्सेस इच्छा मैडम कुछ Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Is my voice audible to you? Yeah, now it's unmuted. I'm able to hear you. Yeah, fine, fine, sir. Sir, we'll wait. Uh, we'll wait for uh, two minutes, sir. Sorry. We'll wait for two minutes, sir. Yeah, sure. Okay.
your voice audible hello uh, madam it's bit low yes, can you speak louder now it's audible sir yes ma'am yeah it's fine yeah hello everyone uh, i had you all had a very cultivating first session now i again welcome you all to the second session of the first day workshop on the art of patenting and drafting organized by the department of pc on the police state of technology and sciences uh, andhra pradesh in this session i heartily welcome mr palaji p which is an advocate currently working as a principal associate with the ipr practice team at surana and surana international tony He also holds specialization in intellectual property and corporate laws from Indian Law Institute, and has over ten years of experience in handling IP legal matters. Today, he will enlighten us with the facts regarding patent enfor enforcement and innovation. So, on the behalf of the whole organizing team, I heartily welcome you, sir. Now, I hand over to Balaji, sir, for taking up the session. Welcome, sir. first of all thank you institute for inviting me to this uh, presentation and like and thank you shumiti for the introduction uh, i will just uh, start sharing my screen the ppt can yes sir are you able to see the screen yes sir you are able to see the screen sir okay Okay. Uh, in this session, we will be discussing about the patent enforcement and litigation procedures in India. In addition to that, we will be also seeing the patent post grant procedures. What are the activities which are involved uh, in post grant uh, after grant of the patents in India? So, firstly, I will just uh, give you a brief introduction about today's session. First, we will be seeing the major thing uh, immediately after grant of patents. Uh, it's not end of it. So. one has to renew his patent uh, uh, since the patent term is for 20 years one will have to renew his patent for every year in india and apart from renewals there are other formalities which the patentee has to be complied in order to keep his patent active and valid otherwise the if you are not paying renewal of if you are not properly maintaining your patent it will get revoked by the patent office it will get cancelled so for first thing is renewal you will have to pay renewals every year um, the second thing is maintenance this maintenance includes uh, working requirements in india there is a concept called working requirement if your patent got granted you will have to submit the details about your uh, actual working actual use of your patented invention in india you will have to submit documents in support of your use at the patent office every year so this has to be uh, filed uh, during the period of april to september of every year you will have to submit the details regarding actual working of your patent in india it could be through any mode but you will have to give the details about the working and all the second thing after uh, grant of patent once you get your patent granted uh, it's not just if it's granted even if it's pending and you have you are sure that it's going to get granted you your invention is patentable then um, the you have to look for the ways of enfor uh, ways of commercializing your patent so there are multiple options available with you either you can uh, manufacture and produce your product uh, invented product on your own and you can commercialize it yourself or you can do it through others by way of granting license to other people this licensing uh, generally if you are an inventor and you have filed your application on your own like you are the only applicant and it's not a company or anything then most of the inventors they generally grant license to third parties big companies so that they can manufacture the product and uh, you will get ap uh, appropriate licensing fee from them and uh, there are other options uh, if you want to keep your uh, patent in your name itself you can go for licensing and uh, you can give license to third party companies they will be paying you the license fee the other option is assignment you can straight away if you want to sell the uh, patented invention to some third party then you can go for assignment so this thing can be done after the uh, grant of patent you can assign your rights or you can give license to third parties so that they can utilize the particular product in the market next major thing after grant of patent is enforcement of your patent rights through courts in india uh, people may generally uh, people generally have this assumption that uh, after grant of patent no one will be able to copy your patent or no one will be no one will be actually misusing your patent but that is not the case uh, 
violation, IP rights violation, particularly patent infringements are happening all over the world. So only thing is that they are not brought to the light and it's not uh, seriously taken by most of the inventors. So uh, the main reason being uh, patent uh, enforcement through courts, it's a lengthy procedure and it also involves a lot of cost. So the patentees has to consider different factors while filing a patent infringement suit before the courts. Because the amount of amount you are going to spend and the time it's going to take in, it has to be proportionally calculated in accordance with the actual benefit you are going to get out of that lawsuit. So the patent enforcement, it's very less. And right now, patent enforcement are not actually used by most of the inventors, most of the patentees. They are simply uh, using their invention, of course, but as per the Patents Act, the rights which is your right which you are getting after a grant of patent is an exclusive right you can exclude others from using the patent it's not just that you can go and use it because anyone who invents a product they can go and use but the purpose of getting a patent granted in your name is to exclude anyone else you exclude all others from using your patented invention so for the purpose of excluding others the only way of uh, the only option available with you is enforcing it through proper channels that is through the courts in India. And uh, next topic we will be covering today will be regarding revocation actions and uh, post grant oppositions in India. In India, as you all know, you must uh, be aware that in India we have pre grant opposition as well as post grant opposition. Uh, any third party can go and file an opposition even prior to the grant of a patent by the patent office or even after the grant of patent. Uh, any third party can go and file an opposition. Same like that, this uh, post grant opposition, it can be filed only within a limited period of time as per the act. Even after that uh, expiry of the time period, anyone can go and file a revocation action against a granted patent. So in case if you get a patent granted in your name, that doesn't mean that you will have a validity. You will be able to enjoy the whole life term of the patent, that is 20 years. Anyone may come and file a opposition against you even after grant. Anyone may come and file a rectification and revocation action against your patent to get it cancelled. So in such cases, we will have to defend our patents before the patent office or before the courts, uh, appropriate courts. That will be very important to keep your patent alive. The last topic which I'll be discussing today is regarding compulsory licensing. This topic is widely discussed uh, in the last uh, seven, eight years because India is one of the country which has granted uh, compulsory license for patents, particularly product patents, which no, uh, no major economy has have, uh, tried, even tried. So this uh, India's uh, procedure, India's practice with respect to issuance of compulsory licensing has been uh, debated and it was even um, there are so many countries which have raised concerns against uh, India's uh, issuance of compulsory licensing in respect of certain product patents. But still, uh, India has a clear patent act in uh, accordance with the agreements which it has entered into, in particular TRIPS agreement. Uh, this TRIPS agreement, trade related aspects of intellectual property rights. This is an agreement which is under WTO, World Trade Organization. India is a party to this uh, WTO as well as it's a member to the TRIPS agreement. So as per the TRIPS agreement, India has to ensure that certain protection is granted to patents. That's why we have a proper patent act. And within the TRIPS agreement, there are certain exceptions which the national, the member state can utilize. One of them is this compulsory licensing, which India is utilizing utilizing in accordance with the TRIPS agreement only. So I'll be explaining about uh, compulsory licensing in detail towards the end of today's session. Let's move to the, the first two things, the renewal maintenance and licensing things are very general, which you will be able to understand on a general search itself because renewal thing you will have to pay every year renewal uh, at the exactly on the same date of your application filing date until 20 years. Maintenance you will have to file the details regarding your statement of working every year between April to September. That is for the previous financial year, you will have to submit the details regarding same like your income tax filing. You will have to submit the details regarding working of your patent in India within the period of six months between April to September and licensing and assignment. If you want to simply grant a license to other parties and keep the patent in your name itself, then you can go for licensing. And if you want to 
entirely transfer the rights to some third parties, we can go for assignment. Uh, detailed session will be with respect to enforcement, revocation actions, oppositions and compulsory licensing. I will just start with enforcement through courts in India. How to understand uh, why we need to enforce our patents? Why can't we simply leave others and uh, utilize your patents? The main reason is main reason for enforcement of your patents before the courts is to get actual monetary reward for your work. You may have invested so much in uh, conducting research, in trials, in testing, everything to arrive at a final product which is patented. Okay, so in order to actually utilize the amount of time and resources which you have spent on uh, getting the patent granted, you will have to properly make sure that no one else is using it so that you will be able to use it exclusively and you will be able to get actual benefit of it. You will be able to sell it through the market directly or through licenses or uh, by way of other means. But it, you have to make sure that you are the only one who have the right to give consent to the use of your patent. You have the right to use uh, the exact thing in the market. If other people are also using that market, then the actual profit which you are getting from the use of the patent, it will be drastically reduced. It's not just about the profit part. Even if someone is misusing your patent, for example, if someone is uh, copying your product and they are uh, there is a manufacturing defect in their product, then it will automatically impact your product as well. Because the main reason is that you have a new invention which is very new in the market and you are the only one using it. So you can make sure that the product uh, which is going to the customers is 100% tested and okay. But on the contrary, if someone else is using without your consent, without your permission, you will not be able to track whether they are providing the exact uh, detail, exact specification and uh, is have we met exact quality has been tested and all. You will not be able to check all these things. So it will in turn ruin your product in the market. So you have to make sure that uh, your product, your invented invention is not actually used by someone else except you and those who have been consented by you. So only way of getting that exclusive use is by way of preventing third parties from using your patented product. Second major importance of getting your patent uh, enforced is you can also claim royalty and damages from the infringers. It's not just that you go and fight a, file a case against them and the court will pass an order against them to stop use of it. The main focus will be to stop others from using your patented invention in the market. But additionally, apart from stopping them from using the product, courts will also grant you damages in respect of the use which they have done and royalty in respect of the actual product. They have actually the number of in, uh, the royalties will be calculated in on different basis. The general thing is on the basis of the number of products they have actually sold in the market and the amount they have, the profit, the profit that they have earned. So on the basis of that, court will be able to give you a particular percentage as royalty to be collected from the infringer. So you will be able to in the same way as you get license fee from your actually consented and authorized licensees. By way of enforcing your patents through courts, those who have not obtained proper license from you, in case they are made some profit, you will be able to recover the same kind of license fee as royalty in patent infringement suits. So this is a major advantage. And uh, in case if you are not properly enforcing your patent in the market, if you are not properly enforcing it uh, in terms of use by the opposite parties or use by your competitors, anyone, the major flaw is that you will be you will not be able to uh, ensure you will not be able to regain whatever you have spent on that. Though you may be able to sell your products in the market in case if your competitor in case of the one who is infringing the product is a big company, they'll be able to promote it like their own product. So you are actually losing your identity identity in the market. If you are the actual inventor, you will be the one who uh, has to be identified as the original owner of that particular product. But if someone, if you are not taking any action against others who are using it, they will be promoting it as their own. There have been cases where uh, the actual defendants, 
they were actually identified the, by the people as the original owner of the patent invention. But in when the courts have actually uh, conducted trial and identify the facts, the original inventor who got patent was somewhere in, in a remote location in India and um, his product, his invention was misused by a third party company, which is a big pharma company. So it is possible that uh, though you are the actual creator, you are the actual inventor of the product, someone will take advantage of that and they will be uh, portraying themselves as the owner. So you will not have to let that happen. In case if you have an invention and you got it patent, patented, then you will have to make sure that it's properly enforced. Nobody else is using your product. And like I said, uh, cost benefit analysis has to be conducted before uh, initiating any infringement or uh, enforcement actions before the courts. Like I said, uh, the cost involved in uh, filing a patent lawsuit and uh, prosecuting the same is really high. So in in order to avoid that, there are other options available. Instead of directly going to the court, you can send, uh, you can uh, contact the opposite party and approach for, uh, ask them to get a proper license. There are other options, settlement options are there, mediations, arbitrations are there. So you will have to, on case by case basis, you will have to properly analyze whether this particular matter, whether you will be getting the 100% benefit if you are filing a lawsuit or in case if you are spending 5 lakh rupees for the lawsuit and you will not be able to recover the same from the opposite party because the opposite party is a small time seller. He's a fly by moon company who simply manufacture 10, 10, 10, 15 products and uh, exit the market. So you will have to analyze each and everything so that you will be able to get a proper benefit out of the lawsuits you are filing. Now with respect to enforcement, I'll just briefly explain you how you will have to en enforce your granted patents in India. First thing is uh, you will have to conduct a proper research and uh, monitoring. You will have to track all the potential infringements happening in the country. There is no single mechanism for uh, conducting all this proper uh, monitoring and research with respect to use of your patented invention by some others. but. The only way is that you will have to enter the market. You will have to do a proper research in the market to see if anyone is actually selling a product which has uh, some process or product patented by you. The, uh, like I said, uh, it's not just a big companies which uh, do this proper monitoring and such. Even small entities, even individuals who got patent granted, they also properly do this because this is actually a way of getting revenue for them. It's not just that uh, even if they are not doing any other activities, once a patent is granted, if it's of that importance that so many parties are copying, the patent holders, they generally do a proper search and ask the opposite parties to get a license from him or uh, fight a case against him to get the royalties and everything done from the opposite party. There are so many patent holders who are doing this exclusively to make revenue out of that. So. Like I said, there is no single mechanism. The only thing is that patent holder has to spend some time and do a proper research so that he'll be able to track the relevant uh, availability of product in the market. Uh, there are, like I said, there are even there are so many small companies. I remember there was one company called uh, Smartfleet LLC in US. They filed a case against Apple in respect of uh, cloud storage mechanism, which uh, they got patented in US, that cloud storage was used in iTunes. So they filed they filed a patent infringement suit against Apple and they actually got, uh, in the trial court, they got over 500, I think 500 million, over 500 million as damages. The trial court has granted that much amount as damages to this small company. But of course the Apple, company Apple Corporation, they have filed an appeal and they got the order vacated, but still the importance of small companies and individual patent holders in conducting this search, proper search and monitoring mechanism for the purpose of enforcing their patent has to be properly understood. It's not that uh, only small companies used to infringe or only a uh, individual person used to infringe someone else's patent. Even big companies knowingly or unknowingly, because even in big companies, the exact people who are producing a uh, new, creating a new product or uh, producing it or marketing it, 
they may have copied your invention they may have showed it in the showed it to their company as a new one and uh, it is possible that even the big companies like apple microsoft they may actually manufacture some product or issue some uh, provide some services which are actually violating someone else's patent so the one who has patent has to make sure that no one not even not even a small company or not a big company has actually violated their products and patents and uh, like i said instead of filing a lawsuit in case if you find that the infringing party is a small entity which has a very limited number of uh, products available in the market or which is not capable of causing so much damage to your actual sale in such cases uh, you can you have this option of sending this violation letter it, in legal terms we also call it as legal notice like we send for other uh, lawsuits not just for patents it's a legal notice we send for generally in for property matters or contractual matters for all matters we used to send legal notices same like that for patent matters we can send a violation letter to the opposite party describing that this is what your patent invention is and uh, you can inform the opposite party the infringer the one who is actually infringing your patent that whatever your product uh, you are marketing in the business it has some process or uh, actual technology which has been patented by you in case if the infringer decides to uh, appreciate your patent if they decide to uh, give license to you for the purpose of man marketing their product they can come and do it even in the other case there are so many infringers after receiving this legal notice they used to stop uh, manufacturing the product and they used to exit the business because they they will not want to contest a case before the courts because in case if they are sure that they copied the product because they are the one who has copied the product so they will be aware that if you are filing a case against them they will definitely lose in such cases after receiving this uh, violation letter itself so many parties they will stop infringing your product and the only thing is that this infringement uh, uh, violation letter it will be useful only in terms of settlement and uh, arbitration like i said um, this uh, before filing a lawsuit you have to explore all the possible options right like uh, this uh, violation letter you can explore the settlement option you can explore you can directly contact the infringer and ask him to stop or ask him to negotiate with you with respect to the license fee in case if he finds that licensing fee which you are offering is high you can negotiate with him and you can go for a settlement instead of actually filing a lawsuit the main reason being filing lawsuit is very costly and it's time consuming here in case if you decided that uh, the actual amount you can re recover from the infringer is not that big then you can try to negotiate with the opposite party and go for a settlement if nothing work or in case if the level of infringement by the opposite party is very high then you will have to go for a lawsuit that will that will be the only option because you don't have to go for other options in case the opposite party has knowingly violating your rights and their uh, actual use is very high which is actually causing uh, some confusion in the market or causing some damage to your product your sale of your own product in the market so in such cases you will have to go and file a lawsuit before the courts and obtain orders against that particular infringing party now uh, i will just explain the basic procedure the brief information about what are the steps involved in filing a lawsuit and what are the steps involved in prosecuting a lawsuit and the different options available during prosecution of the case itself first thing uh, being uh, all lawsuits in india with respect to patents has to be filed before a district court in india there are a, there's a hierarchy of court systems the top court being the supreme court and then below the supreme court it's high court and uh, district courts below high courts within district courts there are sub courts and municipal courts there are various level various stages for patent related matters you can file infringement actions only before the district courts or the courts above district court that is high courts and there are few places where uh, only you can initiate uh, infringement patent infringement action before the high courts on the basis of the actual pecuniary thing the actual level of monetary claims you are making in your petition 
in case if you are going to file a lawsuit driving 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs, you can go and file it before a district court. But in case if your infringement value, the level of infringement by the opposite party is very high and the level of damages and claims you are making is more than one to or more than 10 to depending upon the place you are residing, depending upon the place where the opposite party is residing, you may have to initiate that uh, uh, infringement action only before the high courts. It's purely dependent upon the territory and the level of claim you are going to make. And uh, for the purpose of filing a infringement shoot in India, there is a limitation. Uh, uh, the limitation is not actually prescribed under the Patents Act, but as per the Civil Procedure Code itself, you have to file a shoot for infringement within three years of the actual date of occurrence of infringement. So if you miss this three years period, you will not be able to file a shoot against someone who is violating this because you are accustomed, you, are, uh, you have already let them use the market, uh, particular product for long period, so you will not be able to file a shoot against them. In case if you came to know about their infringement, infringing activities very lately, that is uh, like after two years or after three years of actual date of first date of uh, infringement, then the court will allow you to, they will condone the delay in filing the lawsuits. It's not that the three years period is uh, to be strictly followed. Depending upon the reasons, if you are able to provide a proper cost, a proper uh, reason to the courts, court will condone the delay and they will accept the infringement uh, shoot. They will register the shoot. So, when you are going to file a shoot against some third party infringers, there are different things involved in the same shoot. The first thing, the main focus for you will be to stop the opposite party. So in the main shoot, your first prayer will be to get a permanent injunction from the courts against that infringing party to stop them from using your product. Apart from that, in the main shoot itself, you can also claim the exact damages caused to you due to the use of the infringing product by the opposite party. So you can also claim damages from the opposite party. Like I said, you can also claim royalties from them. The royalties in the same way like the licensing fee. The court will uh, court will come to a particular percentage of royalties at the end of the shoot. But you can also claim for royalties during the pendency of the shoots. And apart from these things, you can also ask for restriction of the infringing products. Like uh, in case if your product, if you have manufactured, uh, if you have invented some new uh, device which can be used for uh, like a tablets and all, which can be used in tablets to write uh, on all touchscreen models, all touchscreen phones, tablets and uh, laptops. If some third party is actually copying your product and uh, using the same in respect of his product, then at the end of the lawsuit, if the court finds that it's a proper infringement and that has to be stopped, you can also ask the court to uh, seize the products and uh, destruct them because they may have uh, marketed their products in their own name, in their own trademark or brand names, which may be different from yours. So you'll not be able to purchase, uh, you'll not be able to get the same from them and uh, sell it in your name. It will be very difficult. So in such cases, you can also ask the court to district all the infringing products so that it will not be made available in the market. And in addition to that, legal costs, generally in most of the matters, the courts will not grant legal costs, the costs involved in filing and prosecuting the particular lawsuit. But if the infringement is very high and it's very evident, in such cases, you, courts will have no hesitation to grant legal cost. You will be able to recover the actual amount you spent in the in filing and prosecuting the lawsuit against the opposite party from them itself. So there are three major things which you can claim from the opposite party damages, royalty and legal cost. It's uh, actually uh, those who are hesitant to file a lawsuit only for the reason that you will be you will have to spend so much on uh, filing and prosecuting the suit. They will have to be aware that there is an option to recover the legal cost from the opposite party itself. But the thing is that you will have to properly analyze that, whether the infringement is actual, whether the opposite party is misusing your rights, whether they will be able to pay you all this cost because the courts may grant you all this damages, royalty and legal cost. But the way of recovery of that has to be done by execution court only. That uh, That's a separate court for execution of the order of the courts. 
and to recover all these damages from the opposite party they must have the source without having source you will not be able to recover it from them so you will have to calculate all these things prior to filing lawsuit itself so you will have to sit properly with the legal team and do all the research before initiating any lawsuits so the main thing which you will be focusing when filing and prosecuting a lawsuit will be this thing permanent injunction stopping the opposite party claiming damages from them royalty from them getting their goods destroyed and recovering legal cost in the meantime like i said filing and prosecuting a legal suit it will it's a time consuming activity it may go for years there are so many patent infringement cases which were filed uh, in 2005 and got resolved only in 2020 uh, 2012 and 13 so it's uh, it will be difficult for the patent holder to stop the opposite party because you will be getting the final order restraining them stopping the opposite party from manufacturing the goods only during the end of the trial which may be 5 or 6 years from now so in order to avoid that in india we have the legal mechanism to obtain temporary orders it's called interim injunction so for that you will have to apply separately within the same original case itself you can apply for a interim injunction against the opposite party for immediately stopping them from using the product so for this interim injunction you will have to apply separately and the court will consider this interim application only on a prima facie cases on a prima facie basis because only during the trial in the main shoot the court will consider all the documents they will look into it, the validity of their claims uh, actual infringement by the opposite parties during the interim stage when you are applying for a temporary injunction court will not look into all those in detail they will simply look into your claims they will see if the opposite party is uh, actually prima facie they are violating your rights if the court has found that they are violating on the basis of the documents which you have produced and the documents which they have produced court will be immediately giving you a interim temporary relief by way of injecting the opposite party until decision in the main shoot so this interim injunction generally a uh, court will give for a particular period of time like 2 years or 3 years and uh, right now in patent cases most of the patent cases infringement uh, interim injunctions are granted until the final disposal of the main shoot so during the Uh, period of prosecution of your case the opposite party will not be able to use the product in the market so apart from temporary injunctions there is an option to go and visit the opposite party's premises in case you are not sure uh, how much the infringing products are in the how much infringing products are manufactured by the opposite party and how much uh, the level of con- uh, infringement they are actually doing conducting the market you can act, uh, you can get an order from the court to conduct a raid at their premises and to also seize the products infringing products kept in their premises so that this apart from uh, stopping them this will also make sure that whatever the product they have already manufactured it will not go anywhere else it will be kept in a proper place and it will be seized you also have another option this uh, in uh, raid and seizure will be generally uh, conducted by uh, a commissioner appointed by a court the court will generally uh, upon your application for a raid and seizure they will uh, in the same way like temporary injunctions they will look into the prima facie things whether you have made a case whether the opposite party is infringing it and uh, whatever they are using is actually violating your rights the court will appoint a court commissioner this court commissioner can go and approach a police station for a uh, con- properly conducting this raid and seizure he will go and note down everything whatever the products they are manufacturing what are the technologies they are using for manufacturing whether the technology is used in the manufacture of their product is similar to or the same as your patented invention they will note down everything and they will properly seize that product and they will submit it before the courts so until the decision is issued in the main shoot the opposite party the infringing party they will not be able to do anything with respect to their products even if they have manufactured so many products they will not be do anything with that and the third thing being uh, there is another option wherein you can go and approach the court to actually stop the opposite party from selling their other properties not just their manufactured product which is violating your uh, invention or patent you can also ask the court on to courts to stop the opposite party from disposing of their other products other uh, properties like uh, if they have some uh, manufacturing facility you can ask the 
court which will grant an order against the opposite party from selling that uh, selling that property sell, selling that manufacturing unit to someone else this is important because once a uh, once they receive uh, information about your patent infringement suit what happens is within this 5 6 years period of trial the opposite party generally they will sell and dispose of all the properties for the name sake they will have a company just for the purpose of uh, defending their uh, patent infringement suit but they will simply sell all the products at the end of the day when you get a uh, damages order for damages royalty and legal cost from the courts there will be nothing to recover from the opposite party because all their properties would have been already sold so in order to avoid this uh, you also can go and file a interim application before the courts to seek an order from the court asking them to restrain the opposite party from selling off their dis, uh, all their assets. It's not just uh, manufacturing unit, including all those uh, tools which they have, all the movable properties they have. The courts can uh, pass order with respect to all the assets of the opposite party, infringing party, from disposing of from selling or transferring it to a third party. So these are the main things with respect to patent infringement shoot in India. These are the different types of shoots, different types of interim application that you can make. And uh, when you file a case before the courts, there are multiple steps. I am talking about the main shoot, not about the interim applications, because interim applications, they are generally decided within uh, three to four months itself. The court will look into the matters prima facie on the basis of the documents you have filed and the opposite party's documents, they will pass orders. But with respect to the main shoot, there are different steps involved. Once you file an infringement action about uh, against an opposite party, then the opposite party will get some time to file his written statement. Subsequent to he filing his written statement, then you can also file reply to his written statement by way of filing a rebuttal. At the time of filing this suit, written statement and rebuttal itself, you will have to submit all the documents available with you, all the relevant documents which are available with you. Because uh, during the prosecution of the case, the courts may not allow you to produce additional documents unless it is necessary. The courts will allow it only if it is necessary for the matter to be decided. Otherwise, the court will not generally allow uh, filing of additional documents during the trial of the case. So at the pleading stage, the filing of pleading stage includes filing of suit, written statement and rebuttal. The pleading stage itself, you will have to produce all the documents available with you against the opposite party in support of your claims in general. So once you have filed your uh, suit and the opposite party files their written submissions and you also, you also file the rebuttal, then the next stage before the courts will be with respect to admission and denial of documents. So whatever the, you are, whatever the documents you are submitting before the courts, the opposite party will be called to admit or deny. They may admit the documents with respect to your patents grant and all. They may deny your documents with respect to infringement and all. So you have the option to admit or deny the documents filed by the opposite party as well. The documents which they will be filing with the written statement, you will have an option to admit or deny. So this admission and denial will go on and then the courts will frame the actual issues. They will note out the issues with respect to the patent infringement suit. The issues could be two to three in general. Generally, the courts issues two through two to three issues. The courts will frame issues on the basis of the documents and admission and denials only. And then comes the next stage. This is very important during all proceedings, not just patent, all proceedings before the courts. This examination of evidence and witnesses. This is a very important stage during which uh, the parties will be able to examine the opposite parties witness and the opposite, opposite part, documents produced by the opposite parties. So in this stage, uh, the court can also appoint some third party experts. Since patent disputes are more technical in nature, which involves different technologies, different industries like uh, technologies with respect to communication things, information technologies, technologies with respect to uh, electronics, technologies with respect to pharmaceutical industry, there are different fields and industries involved. So the court may not be expertised in all these fields. So in order to avoid missing some technical information, relevant technical information, court may also ask some third party experts who are actually experts in the particular domain. If a patent infringement suit is with respect to a DVD or a TV, 
then the court may appoint someone who is expertized in that field of uh, communication electronics and uh, electricals and electronics communications if the patent is related to pharmaceutical industry the court may ask someone who is a phd in biotechnology and uh, biochemistry to get this done so the court can get advice from such uh, third party advisors as well in addition to that apart from court even the one who is filing the lawsuit and the one who is defending the lawsuit can also ask the court to appoint someone as a third party technical advisor so all this will happen the technical advisors report and everything will be done during the examination stage during the examination stage apart from the parties one will have the chance to examine and cross examine the one who is coming as a technical advisor so all these things will happen during the examination of your evidences and witnesses once the examination of witnesses is done and uh, it is properly recorded recorded by the courts then the next stage will be arguments this arguments will go generally for at least 2 to 3 months if it's uh, if it's happening on a regular basis otherwise it may go for years it, mm, we have seen so many cases wherein uh, particularly patent infringement suits wherein arguments were heard for over 3 years because the court has to deal with multiple cases not just patent infringement cases on one day they may allot you time for arguments on which date you will not be you may not be able to complete your arguments so you will have to get additional time for completing your arguments the court will not ask you to finish your argument within a particular period of time unless you are taking so much of time for your arguments the court will properly hear all your arguments they will go through all the proper documents produced by you before passing any order so after arguments the court will pass an order or a judgment depending upon the nature of the suit whether uh, allowing your infringement suit against opposite party or dismissing your suit so these are the major steps involved in uh, prosecution of a particular patent infringement suit so this is all with respect to infringement before the courts in india we have discussed the time period for filing infringement suit where you have to file the infringement suit what are all the procedures involved and what are all the steps involved in filing a suit whether you can obtain a temporary injunction or a permanent one whether you can conduct a raid and seize the opposite party's goods all these things can be done only through a proper enforcement before the courts now apart from enforcement uh, post grant uh, maintenance and all are very important main thing being handling a revocation action because you may get your patent granted by the indian patent office but in case someone is filing a revocation action against that particular granted patent you will have to defend your patent you will have to properly defend your patent before the appropriate forum otherwise the patent office or the forum will pass an order revoking your patent that is cancelling your patent you will lose your patent rights not just from the date of passing of the order from the very beginning from the date of filing itself you will not have any rights it's a predated thing so you will not have any rights with respect to that particular patent in case if it is revoked any time during the pendency of your validity of your patent that is any time during this 20 years period if your patent is revoked by a court or by the patent office then it's done you will not be able to claim any rights or ownership over that particular patent or you will not be able to initiate any action against third parties so there are two kinds of revocation after the grant of patent in india we have the option for filing a opposition action before the grant of patent as well as after the grant of patent before the grant of patent in the sense uh, any time after publication of your uh, patent application during the examination stage any third party can go and file a patent opposition that will be called as pre grant opposition any time after the publication of your patent application but any time before grant of your patent that is called pre grant opposition in india we have this option of filing post grant opposition as well once your patent is granted any third party can come and file not any third party that is the only difference between pre grant and post grant in pre grant oppositions anyone can go and file an opposition even if they don't have any interest in fighting a opposition against you anyone can go and fight but in a post grant opposition only a interested third party can go and fight it go uh, this post grant opposition is actually time limited as well 
you cannot go and file a post grant opposition anytime during the validity of the patent anytime during this 20 years period you cannot do that you can do it only within a particular period of time so for post grant opposition there are certain grounds given under the patent act only on the basis of those grounds you can initiate a post grant opposition okay. first ground is conflicting priority date i hope you are aware of this concept of priority date in patents um this priority date came from uh, some international convention called paris convention wherein uh, in case if you filed a patent application you uh, filed a patent application in india today you will have 12 months time period for filing a patent application in the countries which are party to this paris convention you can file a patent application in us within 12 months claiming your filing date from india so that means that your application filing date in india will be the actual date of filing in us as well even if you file it after 11 months period your us application will get a priority date from your indian filing date so at the time of enforcing your patent this priority date will play a major role because that priority date will tell you that this is the actual date when your patent application all over the world was filed the first 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 application all over the world was filed so in case if the granted patent has some conflicting priority date for example if a patent application in india is claiming priority from us application filed last year in such cases it has to be properly followed it has to be exactly within the 12 months period first application in us on 25th of uh, april 2020 2021 in such case your application has to be filed exactly on today if you are filing your application tomorrow even a one day delay will lead you to cancel your uh, patent after grant after grant if you are uh, if any third party is filing opposition on the basis of this priority dates conflicting priority dates the patent office will simply revoke your patent they will cancel your patent so this 12 months period has to be strictly followed if you are filing application here on today within 12 months you can file it in any international jurisdictions in any international countries which are parties to the paris convention same like that if you are filing your first patent application somewhere in us or uk or if you are filing your first patent application via pct the patent cooperation treaty international application if you are filing in such cases you will have to file your indian application exactly within 12 months even one day delay will cost you revocation or cancellation and the other ground are general terms on general grounds only this includes uh, you must be aware of the patent liability criteria the exact things which can get patented this includes novelty the invention must be new industrial applicability the invention which you are prepared is must be actually used utilized industrially it will not uh, it should be it should not be theoretically given it has to be actually used in the market it has to be industrially used and the third one inventive step the inventive step if your patent has the existing technology but it has some additional future and additional efficacy then only it will get granted Uh, it will get granted so if uh, any of these three grounds are not met with by a granted patent then a post grant opposition can be filed if a invention which is not new or which is already there in the public domain it, this public domain includes a previously filed patent application as well as the information available all over the world in general it could be a journal or it could be an article published on a newspaper it could be a youtube video describing about the uh, patent and invention it could be anything if that particular granted patent is not new or if it is already there in the public domain anyone can come and file a, the interested parties can file a post grant opposition and the patent office will refuse uh, cancel your granted patent same like that inventive step if uh, your invention the granted patent doesn't have any inventive step it doesn't have Uh, it has uh, information which are very obvious to the person who was killed in that particular domain then the interested third parties can file a opposition on the basis of this ground and it, they will get they will get your patent revoked same like that the third criteria if uh, your patent is not uh, industrially usable if it cannot be actually used in the market it will not be useful for the public then the patent office will 
revoke your patent on the basis of opposition filed by an interested third party. Same like the novelty principle, if your invention, the granted invention is also claimed in another patent, which is prior to you, then also the patent office will refuse to uh, revoke your patent and cancel it. And this point is very important because there are so many lawsuits which are coming before the courts on the basis of this ground filed by a person who is actually not entitled to file. This actually means that if a patent applicant is not the one who has actually invented it or if the patent applicant, he is not the one who has actually uh, invested some money in getting the patent inventor, he is not actually entitled to file. Simply, uh, if I can give you an example of uh, this uh, person who are not entitled to file, but they have filed and obtained patent. This mainly involves so many big companies. These companies, they are not the actual inventors. It's just a legal entity. Company is just a legal entity. But the person who are working for the company, they are the actual inventors. So for the purpose of filing patent application, only the actual inventor has to file. The second option is the actual inventor who is working for a company on a full time basis and who has manufactured, who has invented the product during the course of his employment. In such case, one day the company can go and file the patent application. There are so many companies which have actually utilized the, which have taken the invention, invention actually found by this uh, employees and they filed it on their own name without mentioning the actual person who has invented the employee's name as a inventor in patent applications i hope uh, in the morning session uh, you must have uh, discussed regarding the exact details to be mentioned in the patent application in patent application the main thing is name of the applicant the applicant could be an inventor the applicant could be a company where the inventor works the applicant could be someone who got the patent uh, the inventor has assigned something to the particular person so applicant and the inventor are two different things it's not exactly the applicant who always the inverter who always file the patent application. In terms of companies, there are so many companies which have filed their patent application on their own name without mentioning the name of the actual inventor in the patent application. That is a mandatory requirement as per the patent act that to mention the name of the inventor in the patent application. But there are so many companies which have filed like that and there are so many cases on the basis of this. When you are going to work for a particular company, you have to make sure if you are involved in a development of a particular product, if uh, you are involved in development of some software or some technology, then you will have to make sure that the company is uh, properly utilizing it. If the company is properly mentioning your name as an inventor in case if they are filing a patent application. Without your knowledge itself, it is possible that the companies may file patent application and they may get it granted. In such cases, you can go and file a post grant opposition against them. You can file an opposition stating that you are the actual inverter. You have to submit documents in respect of that. In such case, the patents will get revoked itself. So you uh, this term with respect to this ground with respect to filing opposition, post grant opposition is very important. And uh, everyone has to, every inventor has to make sure that uh, their name is mentioned in the patent application. And they will also have to track if their employer is actually filing a patent application and respect of the particular technology that you have developed. You will have to monitor and track all these things so that your name will be there in the patent application. Naming uh, naming the inventor in the patent application has many benefits. Like if uh, some employer is having his name, uh, if, if he is the inventor of so many patents, that is an added advantage for him. He can go and join. I mean, there are so many companies which are looking for inventors instead of those who are uh, actually working on the proper theoretical things. So make sure that uh, whenever you are working for some third parties, whenever you are preparing something for a third party, they are not filing patent application. If they are filing patent application, then your name must be there. So the entitlement to file a patent application has to be properly conducted. It has to come from the inventor only. Same like that, there are so many institutes which uh, in the name of manufacturing products, they used to obtain information regarding a new technology from particular persons. Uh, for example, if uh, someone is not aware of patent rights and they have not uh, actually filed for a patent application, some inventor has uh, not filed any patent application, but he actually wanted to manufacture the product and sell it in the market. 
for that purpose he has hired some third party who is specialized in developing some technical uh, tools with respect to that invention so he approached him and he got his product manufactured but by the time he entered into the market the actual the person who has manufactured that he got a patent in his name though he was not actually entitled to file the patent he got it from some different source for the purpose of manufacturing only he received the information from the patent holder uh, in sorry not the patent holder the inventor he received the uh, information regarding the technology from the inventor only for the purpose of manufacturing that product but he misused it and he actually filed it so in such cases the inventor has an option to file this post grant opposition and get the patent revoked and same like the first three patentability criteria in case if the patented product is not actually an invention defined under the act then the interested third parties can go and file an uh, opposition against them though the indian patent act doesn't actually describe what is invention it only talks about uh, yeah, as per the definition part in the indian patents act an invention is something uh, new uh, which has some inventive step involved and which is industrially applicable that is the definition which is given in the patent act for a term invention but as per the patent act there is one entire section section 3 which talks about what are all the inventions which are not patentable there are so many inventions which were given under the section 3 of the indian patents act which cannot be patented which cannot be considered as invention for the purpose of granting patent so if a, a granted patent is coming under that category then any third party can go and file an opposition and getting it revoked and this option the uh, filing as a counter claim in an infringement suit this will come during the revocation section only so these are the major grounds for initiating an opposition against a granted patent so now we will see the procedure thing procedural aspect of filing a post grant opposition who can file only an interested third party or company can file a opposition against a third party uh, opposition against a granted patent and uh, the forum you will have to file post grant opposition only before the patent office having appropriate jurisdiction in india procedure you will have to file that post grant opposition within one year from the date of publication of the grant of patent so after this one year period you will not be able to file any opposition against a granted patent but there are other options available like i said uh, revocations can be filed we will discuss it later right now uh, with respect to opposition you cannot file opposition against a granted patent after one year from the actual date of grant so before the patent office you will have to file this notice of opposition uh, along with this opposition we will have to file a written statement and evidences all the evidence has to be filed at this stage itself so once you file the opposition post grant opposition the patentee the one who has grant who has been granted patent he has to file his reply statement and evidence within a period of 2 months and then you will also get a time uh, same like the litigation procedures in courts as, uh, in patent office as well during the oppositions all the parties will have the option to file their submissions and evidences after the patent files his reply uh, statement then the one who is opposing may file his reply evidence within two one month in case if the patent is not filing any reply evidence and documents within the two months period the uh, opposition will be allowed and the patent office will revoke the patent so after grant of patent you will have to make sure that no opposition is pending against your patent application in case if someone files an opposition you will have to defend it properly the as per the act the time period is very limited it's only 2 months so once you receive a notice of opposition from the patent office you will have to defend it so that it will be valid otherwise the patent office after the expiry of 2 months period they will revoke your patent and like i said you do not get any rights from the date of filing itself not just from the date of uh, actual passing of this order so after this pleadings in the opposition proceedings uh simultaneously uh, when you are filing a uh, when someone is filing a notice of opposition and the patent files the reply statement simultaneously the patent office will uh, constitute a board called opposition board for each matters they will uh, constitute a opposition board and this board will have three members 
this three member will be some examiners and uh, controllers from the patent office who will have to submit their report and recommendations with respect to the opposition file within three months period. So in the three months period from the filing of opposition at one place, at one side, the patentee will have to file reply and the pleadings will go on. On the other side, this opposition P, uh, opposition board, they will decide regarding the uh, actual validity validity of the notice of opposition and they will also provide their report and recommendation to the patent office. Then subsequently, a hearing will happen with respect to the opposition's. The parties to the proceedings will be provided opportunities for hearing. And then the controller will pass an order. The patent office will pass an order after considering all the submissions made by the parties as well as the opposition board established by the patent office. They will consider all these things and pause an order with respect to allowance of the supposition or revocation of the uh, cancellation of the patent. So this is all with respect to oppositions. And the next topic will be revocations before the patent of uh, in India. Apart from this oppositions, you have the option to file revocation action against a granted patent. Like I said, for opposition, there's a time limit for filing a post grant opposition. That is one year from the date of publication of grant. But this revocation actions can be filed anytime during the validity of the patent. There is no specific time limit after the grant of patent. Anytime during the validity and uh, enforcement of uh, during this 20 years period of validity of the patent, any interested party can file a revocation action. The difference between the post grant opposition and this revocation is that in post grant opposition, only an interested party can file a revocation action. But here in uh, uh, in post grant opposition, only an interested party can file an opposition. Here, even the central government or a person against whom an infringement suit is filed, they can come and file a revocation action. Uh, briefly, we will see the grounds of revocation. Most of the grounds will be the same as uh, opposition, post grant oppositions like not a new invention that three patent criteria. If someone is something is missing, then someone can go on for the interested party can go and file a revocation action. Apart from that, invention was already grant, uh, claimed in another granted patent. Not entitled to file. Wrongfully filed by some third parties, not an invention under the Act Section 3. So these are the grounds which are same as the post grant opposition. In addition to that, revocation action can be filed as a counterclaim in an infringement suit. So in the beginning, we were discussing about the lawsuits filed before the court, right? So in those lawsuits filed by some party, if you are the defendant, again, assume the infringement suit has been filed, you have an option to claim, file a counterclaim stating that the actual patent, granted patent is not valid. This will be called as counterclaim in an infringement suit. Revocation action can be filed as a counterclaim in an infringement suit or separately before the courts. Earlier, there was a board called Intellectual Property Appellate Board, which has been uh, dispersed, and right now all the powers of that board is with high courts. So this revocation actions can be established, uh, can be initiated before the high courts. Another important thing with respect to revocation is that if uh, your patent application fails to disclose all the information which are required, all the uh, if your patent application doesn't have the sufficient information, it doesn't disclose all these things, then also some third party can file an application for revocation. Particularly in India, there is some uh, uh, requirement with respect to disclosure of foreign patent applications for the same invention filed by you. If you are filing a patent application in India and you are filing for the same same invention in some other countries, something is wrong. So, uh, in order to comply with that, the applicant has to properly inform the patent office with respect to all the patent application filed for that particular invention in other countries. If the applicant has failed to produce all these documents, if the patent holder has failed to produce all these documents, then any third party can come and file a revocation action. The interested third party can file a revocation action against you on the basis of which the patent will be revoked. And in case if your invented pay, uh, patented invention is related to atomic energy, the central government, it's 
uh, only the central government, not any third party, only the central government can file for a revocation before the high courts. Same like that, central government can also uh, file a revocation in case your granted patent is against the interest of the nation or is against the public interest. So the last two grounds can be initiated only by the only by the central government. All other grounds can be filed by the person who are actually interested in filing revocation. In case if you are filing a lawsuit against the party, they can file an revocation action against you. In case if you are sending any legal notice to them, on the basis of that, they will be uh, they will be the aggrieved person on the basis of this patent. So they will also file a revocation action against you. So these are the major grounds for uh, filing initiating a revocation action. The main ground being a counterclaim in a infringement suit. This is uh, the major ground which are raised in most of the infringement suit. In most of the infringement suit, when someone is uh, defending their case, they will file a simply they will file a counterclaim for revocation of your patent on the basis of all these grounds. Revocation actions like oppositions, oppositions can be uh, filed before the grant of patent. Anyone can file an opposition. After the grant of patent, only the interested parties can file a post grant opposition. For revocations, only the interested parties can file it. In addition to that, the central government can also file revocations on the basis of the last two grounds mentioned in the previous slide. In case the invention is related to atomic energy or if the invention is against the public interest, then the central government itself can file a revocation action before the courts. And where to file the revocation action? Earlier there was a intellectual property office, uh, intellectual property appellate board, wherein uh, all this revocation action used to be initiated. Right now it's only before the high courts you will have to file the revocation actions. Uh, procedure, uh, procedure to be followed before the high courts in respect of revocation actions will be the same like the litigation procedures. What are the lawsuits you are filing? In lawsuits like we, ex I explained. You will have to file the pleadings. The parties has to file pleadings along with documents. Then the courts will frame issues. They will examine the witnesses. Then the argument will happen. It will be the same thing after arguments. The court will pass order. The court may also appoint some uh, expert technical expert to assist them. So all these things will also happen in revocation actions. The procedure for revocation of your patent before the courts, it will be the same. Earlier IPAB was there right now since IPAB is not uh, it's dissolved. We are not required to discuss that here. And uh, yeah, this is all with revocations before the courts. And now we will. I will just explain briefly regarding compulsory licensing. This compulsory licensing is a term which you may have heard in the recent past where, uh, with respect to so many new drugs developed for uh, coronavirus. Uh, there have been talks about uh, patent waiver and compulsory licensing with respect to drugs and all. But this topic of compulsory license is not new to India. India is the country where uh, which has granted compulsory license uh, for a product patent in. Uh, like uh, I start during the starting of the session, I talked to you. I told you regarding this uh, trips agreement and uh, India's compliance with trips agreement. This compulsory license is the licensing is also one of the major things which is covered under the, under the TRIPS agreement. Under the TRIPS agreement, the countries has to grant certain level of prod, uh, production for the new invention and patent. At the same time, in case if uh, there is some interest, uh, which uh, uh, in case if uh, the country has some national interest or if uh, the patented product is not actually utilized in that country, in such cases, compulsory licensing can be grant, uh, granted by the patent office or the courts. So the grounds of compulsory licensing in India right now, we have three major grounds for compulsory licensing. It could be any of these three. First thing, patent and invention is not worked in India. So if you get a patent granted in India, you will have to use that patent in India and you will have to, like I said, uh, uh, you will have to submit documents in support of use every six months. Uh, from April to September, you will have to produce the documents in support of uh, claim uh, statement and documents in support of use of your invention in India. So if you are not submitting those documents, if you are not actually using the patented invention in India, in such case, any interested third party can file a compulsory application for compulsory licensing before the patent office, and they will also get your 
uh, license from uh, in, instead of getting a voluntary license, they will get a compulsory license from the patent office. There's a difference between this voluntary licensing and compulsory thing. Voluntary licensing is something which you want to give to third parties, like we discussed during the uh, first uh, in the first slide. We were talking about the uh, ways of granting license and assignments and all. There are different ways of granting license. If you want to sell your product directly, you are not required to give any license. You can go and directly sell it, sell it in the market. If you do not have that capacity to manufacture and sell it in the market, you can give it to some third party big companies. You can grant license to them. That is called a voluntary license. You yourself voluntarily license them and you are getting a license free from a license fee from them. But this one compulsory license, it will come when you are not interested in giving a voluntary license, but the opposite party wants to the person who has applied for a compulsory license, he wants to use the product. He wants to sell the product in the market. In such case, he will go and file a application before the patent office for a compulsory license. Uh, these are the grounds like uh, in case if the patent is not working in India, anyone can go and file. Uh, the interested party can go and file. Second requirement is the uh, actual requirement of the public has not been met with by the invention. First thing is you are not at all using the patent or product in India. Second thing, you are using it in the uh, market. You are actually manufacturing your patent or invention and you are selling it in the market and you are making it available for the public. But the actual requirement of public is so high that you are not able to meet it. In such case as well, the patent office will grant compulsory license to the interested third parties who have applied for it to manufacture and uh, sell that product in the market in addition to you selling yourself or through your licenses. If you or your licenses are not in a position to meet the public requirement, if the public needs a thousand products per day and you are not able to manufacture thousand products, in such case, the option is that you can give voluntary license. If you are not giving voluntary license, the patent office will grant compulsory license to the person who are actually interested. So the second requirement is you are not meeting the public requirement. And the third one is the patent and invention, the actual product available in the market by you or by your licensee is not affordable. It's not available in the price which is affordable by the general public. This term is um, Mainly, uh, there are so many concerns raised by different countries with respect to this particular class in the Indian Patents Act because the compulsory license which uh, are granted in on the basis of the price of the product is against the patent holder's right. It is the patent holder who can decide how much amount he has to charge from the consumers for his product because he is the one who has invested so much in the creation of that particular invention and technology. In such case, he will be given the free uh, freedom to charge the consumers with respect to the amount, uh, with respect to the price and all. But in India, the public interest also has to be dealt with and uh, particularly with respect to pharmaceutical patents. In 1970, uh, when the Patents Act was drafted and in 2002, when it got enforced, the major terms introduced with respect to this uh, affordable price thing is keeping in mind the uh, population in India and the affordability of uh, high high cost drugs. It's only it's the main reason for introduction of this class is with respect to the pharmaceutical patents. There are so many cases filed uh, and most importantly the only compulsory license granted in India is also in respect of a pharmaceutical product uh, so far. So these are the main three Oh, sorry, there was a technical problem. I was not able to get connected. Uh, 
I hope I'm audible now. Yeah, thank you. So these are the major grounds and uh, with respect to compulsory leasing, only the interested person who has the capacity to manufacture the product and distribute it in the market, he will be able to file an application for compulsory license. This compulsory license, one more thing, this person cannot directly go and file for compulsory license. He has to approach the patent holder first for a voluntary license. In case if he is not able to come in terms with the patent holder with respect to voluntary licensing, then only he can go and file for a, apply for a compulsory license before the patent office. So the forum, it's only the patent office. You cannot go and file an application for a compulsory license before the courts in India. You can approach the patent office with an application for a compulsory license. Only if you have a capacity, you have the cap uh, ability to manufacture and market such product in the market. And only if the invention, uh, only if the patented invention comes under any of these three categories that invention is not worked in India or not uh, public requirement is not met with or the price is too high, not affordable by the public in India. And procedure for compulsory licensing in India. Someone can uh, that interested person can file a compulsory licensing application for compulsory licensing only after three years from the grant. This three three years period is provided for the patent holder to actually utilize actually market and manufacture his product. So if he is not able to meet that requirement and uh, using requirement in India within this three years period, only after the three years period, anyone can go and file an application for compulsory licensing. This three years period is from the date of grant of the patent. So if someone is filing an application in 2021 <coughs> and the patent got granted in 2025, so only in 2028 someone can file an application for compulsory licensing. Until then, it's only the patent holder who can utilize that particular patent. And application for compulsory license must state the nature of the applicant's interest and capacity. So <clears throat> the person who has applied for a compulsory license, he has to mention that he has already, <clears throat> he has to clarify that he has already requested for a voluntary license before the courts. <laughs> voluntary, voluntary license uh, with the patent holder, which got rejected. And also he has the capacity to manufacture and meet the public requirement. And then this compulsory licensing application, unlike the patent litigation, revocation or opposition actions, it will not be inter-parties proceeding. It will not be between the parties, the patent holder or the person who has applied for compulsory licensing. He will not be involved in the decision making process. He will not be, he will not be given a chance to argue, counter argue, examine, cross examine, file a submission, return submission. The patent holder will not be allowed to do all these things because the patent office will decide the application for compulsory licensing ex parte. It will be dealing it only on the basis of the request made by the applicant for compulsory licensing. It will not ask the uh, patent holder for comments. The patent office will decide itself on the only on the basis of the application filed by the applicant for compulsory licensing. And like I said, in India, the only compulsory license granted is uh, with respect to an anti-cancer drug, sort of an iptoshtle. This uh, compulsory licensing, uh, actually the patent was owned by Bayer Corporation. It's a US company. They own the patent for this particular uh, anti-cancer drug. And Natco Pharma, they, this, this Natco is an Indian company. They filed a request for voluntary license which got rejected by Bayer and subsequently Natco filed an application for compulsory licensing before the patent office, which got allowed. Uh, he filed it in the filed it in 2021 and the patent office uh, after examining all the documents, they granted compulsory licensing in 2012. So as a part of this uh, order, the patent office clearly mentioned that the Natco Pharma, they will have to pay 6% of the sale value as uh, royalty as a licensing fee to Bayer Corporation. So irrespective of whether it's a compulsory licensing or voluntary licensing, the patent holder will be getting the royalty fee, the license fee. But the only thing is that in terms of compulsory licensing, it's the patent office will decide the exact license fee. In this particular case, the license fee claimed by Bayer was very high. That's the reason only why Natco went for a compulsory licensing. 
when the natco when natco approached bayer for license to manufacture the product in india the license fee asked by bayer was very high which was not disclosed before the courts that's the reason why natco came and filed for a compulsory license <clears throat> and during the trial of this proceeding uh, uh, actually uh, after getting the compulsory license after the grant of compulsory license by the patent office in 2012 Bayer Corporation they filed an appeal against the order of the decision of the controller, decision of the patent office before the Intellectual Property Appellate Board. At that point of time, Intellectual Property Appellate Board was there, and uh, in the Appellate Board, Bayer contended that they are also using the product. They said that their product meets the requirement of Indian population and all. But during the examination of trial, it was revealed that only. 2% of the uh, the actual need of the particular goods in india was 2000 per month that is 2000 product per month was required for patients in india but actually bayer was actually imported their manufactured product from some other country and they sold it in india and the actual product sold by them only met 2% of the patients requirements only 2% of the patient requirements were met by bayer during the particular period of time also the third thing so that means that uh, bayer was not able to meet the requirement of public in india though the requirement was 2000 per month they were able to meet only 2% in such case voluntary uh, compulsory license needs to be granted and uh, the intellectual property appellate board in the same case they also noticed that the cancer drug which was sold by bayer in india it costed around 2.9 lakhs for one month dose of that particular drug so if a patient has to administer the drug for a one month period he has to spend 2.5 2.9 lakh for bayer's particular product which is which has been imported from some other country but the version which natco has created it will cost it was actually costed only 10000 to 30000 for one month dose so the third category affordability of the patent or product that was also very high with respect to bayer's anti cancer drug whereas natco was able to manufacture the same thing of course that's a generic product because natco has not invested anything with respect to research and investment they are not did anything with respect to actual invention of the product only bayer has spent so much money for uh, coming at that product but the exact amount is very different was very different so that uh, the people in india were not able to actually they were not they could not afford to buy that particular product due to the cost that was also one of the reason which was mentioned in the ipb order uh, with respect to uh, grant of compulsory licensee so after getting a negative order from ipb player also went for an appeal it, they filed a writ petition before the bombay high court against ipb order which was also rejected by the bombay high court subsequently they went for an appeal before the supreme court which was also rejected everything happened in just a period of 4 years time within this 4 years period of time the compulsory licensing application was decided and the uh, appeal filed by them appeal filed by bayer before the ipab was rejected appeal against the ipab order before the bombay high court by bayer was rejected supreme court appeal was rejected so finally it came to an end in 2014 where the supreme court clearly confirm that a compulsory license granted to natco is valid so that was the only first and only compulsory license granted in india so far there have been so many applications filed before the patent office but uh, most of them are not decided at or they are dismissed this is the only compulsory licensee license granted for a pharmaceutical company in india against which there are so many countries which are against a grant of compulsory licensing but still india in order to balance the interest of public as well as the inventor they have a, we have the clear patent act and the provisions which are made in the interest of public so this is the only patent case where compulsory license was granted and the appeals were dismissed and uh, also compulsory license grant of compulsory licensing will also lead to a revocation of a patent compulsory license the grant of compulsory license will not actually revoke the patent in general it's only same like to a third party a voluntary license which the patent holder gives to the third party in terms of compulsory license it is the government which is mandating the patent holder to grant license to particular applicant to use their particular product but in case 2 years from the issuance of compulsory license 
even at that point of time, the patent holder is not able to meet the same requirement. Like the three grounds which I mentioned here, it's not worked in India. Patent is not uh, the manufactured product. The number of product marketed in India is not meeting the requirement of public in India. The price is too high. The affordability in India, the product is not affordable. In case, even after grant of compulsory licensing to the uh, the patent holder is not able to use the product in India within the next two months. If he is not able to meet all the requirements within the next two months, in such case, or even the central government can come up an application before the high courts for revocation of the patent. Once the patent is revoked, there is no requirement for filing a compulsory license. There is no requirement for asking for a voluntary license. So the patent holder, he has only five years period after the grant of patent to actually use his product in India. Otherwise, it will get revoked. Not directly, but there are different steps involved in this revocation. First thing, after three years of grant of patent, if your patent is not used in India, not meeting the public requirement or it's not, it's very costly. Someone may, the interested parties may come and file an application for compulsory license. And after the grant of compulsory license, even after then two years period of time has left and you are still not using the product in India and you're not meeting the requirements and all. In such case, even the central government can come and apply for a revocation of your patent. In such case, patent will revoke for sure. After uh, getting in, after uh, looking into all the documents, the courts will definitely revoke it. So far, no revocation has been uh, applied for or happened this way. That is through compulsory license and then revocation. But there are so many revocations. Uh, we discussed in the earlier session uh, revocations on the basis of other things like on the grounds of uh, non patentability of the invention on the grounds that the inventor is not mentioned in the application. The applicant has not is not entitled to file the patent application. There are so many revocation happened on that grounds, but on the basis of compulsory license, no revocation happened so far. And also there are so many compulsory license applications pending before the patent office, which are yet to be decided. And uh, I'll just uh, to complete the session, I'll just give you some uh, few examples of decided cases in India with respect to patent enforcement, patent uh, litigations and all, uh, through which you will be able to understand how these things are happening, how a patent holder is fighting cases and how uh, opposite parties are defending their case. And the main first thing I want to discuss is uh, the case of Novartis versus Sipla. These two are again pharmaceutical companies. Novartis is a big pharma company and they filed a case against Sipla in respect of some uh, drug which is used for treatment of uh, respiratory disorder. So this is the, there is some uh, particular, this uh, indacetrol malate, which uh, was inverted by this uh, Novartis and they got patent in India as well. Uh, when they apply, uh, when the third party, the Sipla, they manufactured a generic version of this invented product. Now what is approached the court for an injunction against Sipla. In defense, Sipla was stating that uh, the product, the particular drug is not available in India. The particular product is not work. It's not available in India. And also the products, the cost of other countries very high. So in a particular product is uh, not used in India, that's why they have manufactured. But the court rejected that term because if, uh, the product is not manufactured in India. The first thing the opposite party has to do is go and approach the patent holder for a voluntary license. If it's not happening, then they had the option of filing a compulsory license application. But in this case, Sipla has not filed any record for compulsory license. Institution of the suit only after filing of this case, they went for a compulsory license application. But before that, they have not done anything. They simply manufactured a generic version in the Indian market. So court rejected that claim, stating that uh, when you have another option, where another legally enforced licensing are available, you have not utilized that. In view of that, Sipla cannot come and uh, get the opposite party. The inverted patent is not working in India. So the price and 
compulsory licensing difference the grounds mentioned for compulsory licensing cannot be used uh, infringement action as a defense by any defendants so in this case court clearly injected ship, uh, ship law from manufacturing and marketing that patented invention second major case is novartis ag versus union of india this is one of the widely discussed case because this case uh, involves some important term important provision of the patent act section 3d i hope you were informed about section 3d earlier uh, during the morning session this 3d it talks about the efficacy uh, like i said section 3 totally includes the different types of inventions which are not patentable those inventions which are provided uh, listed under section 3 this cannot be patented in india so section 3d talks about certain inventions which merely has some additional future additional form than the existing invention so if there is an existing invention if there is some additional future added to that existing invention but that additional future is not actually effective with respect to the outcome with respect to the industrial use of that product then that paid, uh, that invention cannot be patented in india this case involves one such uh, additional invention the additional form of known invention this you know what is they had a patent for a uh, imatinib uh, they already got a patent and they were utilizing that patent but subsequently they found a new form they merely added a new form in that particular uh, new molecule to that particular patent invention they applied for another patent application that means they filed the first application in 1995 so their patent will expire in 2015 so in order to avoid getting their patent expired they added a new form the mere just a new change a new minute change they have made to the existing invention they applied for a new patent this uh, in patent terms we call it as patent evergreening like uh, you get a patent earlier and during the expiry of the patent you file another patent application with a new addition you get patent for that as well and you are enforcing that for the next period of 20 years so in this case they filed the first application in 1995 and they filed another application in 1999 so it will be like four year period they will be extending the term of their original patent itself because there is no improvement in the actual product this is also a cancer uh, cancer drug uh, it's a drug to be used for treatment of cancer In this case, no. What is they had a patent? They applied for another patent. So that was rejected by the controller of uh, controller general of patents in India. The patent office rejected their patent application, stating that their invention is not actually an invention covered under the patent act. It is an invention which is mentioned under the section three of the Indian Patents Act, which are talking about non-patentable inventions because they merely added a change. They made a mere change in the form which is already patented. but the same form is not actually increasing the efficacy of the already patented invention so they refused to grant patent for this one and subsequently they filed an appeal before the ipb same like the natco and bayer's compulsory licensing saga here as well no what is filed an appeal before the ipb i appeal before the court high court appeal before the supreme court and everywhere their appeal got rejected and it was clearly established in india that no patent can be ever green you cannot keep on uh, continuing your patent by way of merely adding a small change or merely adding a small form to the existing invention which has no actual increase in the efficacy of the invention the next major case is a case between philips and uh, some individual rajesh bansal in this case actually philips they uh, they are they are the one who has actually invented this dvd players the technology used in latest dvd players they are the one who has invented it and they also got the patent granted in 1995 itself in india so what happened was this opposite party rajesh bansal he was actually uh, exploiting the invention he also manufactured same with the same specification with the same product used by philips sub products used by philips he also manufactured dvd players and he also sold it in the indian market for a very long period so philip after coming uh, after uh, getting their pri- uh, patent granted in 2009 they filed a suit before the high court uh, delhi high court in that case after examining all the uh, pleadings of the party the decision was granted by the court and uh, during the decision during the when the decision was actually granted the patent got expired 
the uh, Phillips actually applied for this. Uh, they filed a suit to restrain Rajesh Bansal from stopping uh, manufacture, stop manufacturing the DVD players using their technology. They also claimed other damages like punitive damages, royalties and all. But when the case was actually decided, when the final order was granted, the patent already got expired. So at that point of time, court was not able to grant any injunction because after expiry of patent, court has no rights to restrain others from using the product. 20 years period is only granted. After 20 years, anyone can utilize the product. It's public domain. It will be in public domain. Anyone can manufacture and use their product in the market. They can also sell it. So court refrained from granting any injunction against the defendant Rajesh Bansal because the patent was expired in 2015. But in this case, court very well analyzed the matter and they have granted punitive damage. That is the uh, punitive damage in the sense punishing the opposite party to the tune of 5 lakh rupees. The court has granted 5 lakh rupees in addition to the legal cost invested by Phillips for filing and prosecuting the case. So the damages were granted. In addition to that, the court also calculated the license fee to be paid to Phillips. The court clearly calculated it as uh, USD 3.175 per DVD sold by him. He not only sold it in India, he also exported it. So the court came to uh, calculate this license fee in two stages. First one, from the date when the suit was actually uh, instituted, instituted until 2010 when the patent was granted. And then one, uh, the 3.175 percentage was in respect of the actual product manufactured and sold by Rajesh Banshal from the date of institution of the suit, from the date of filing of the suit to 2010. So after 2010, when the patent grant granted, the value was calculated as 1.90 from uh, the 2010 when the patent got granted to the expiry of the patent, that is until 2015. So it clearly it devised a particular way of calculation of licensing fee in respect of all the infringing products. And uh, Phyllis was able to recover all this money from the opposite party. And uh, this, this is an important case with respect to enforcement of patents. Even though your patent got expired, you will be able to claim royalty and licensing fee from the opposite party. Even if the court is not uh, granting any, uh, even if uh, for, there are so many cases wherein uh, after filing the lawsuit, the opposite party may stop using it and they may come and file a affidavit before the court stating that I have stopped the product and uh, that's why the case may be dismissed and all. Even in such cases, the court may not pass order in respect of uh, restraining the opposite party from using the product. Court may restrain, uh, court may not issue any order with respect to stopping them from using the product because they have already stopped. But the court will issue order in respect of damages that has been caused to you and the court, uh, the court will be granting royalty fee, license fee. They will calculate license fee and grant it to the patent holder. So in India, we have a clear patent act which defines everything. It actually balance, it has a, it keeps a clear balance between the rights of the inventor, rights of the patent holder and the rights of the public in general by of granting compulsory licensing. It also provides the rights of the uh, patent holder by way of uh, enforcing against the third parties, by way of uh, stopping others and uh, others from misusing the patent. At the same time, it also makes sure that the public in India are not getting affected because of the patent invention. Public in India are not getting the product for the reason that the patent holder is selling it at a high cost. So this is with uh, in India, we have a clear balance within the rights of the parties rights of the uh, patent holder as well as the public. These are the major divisions and uh, I hope I have covered all with respect to patent enforcement and uh, revocation actions in India. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you, sir. So you're, you're letting us with the detailed text regarding patent rights and enforcement rule. It is safeguard our research interest. Um, now I ask the participants if they have any uh, queries, they could either send in the chat box or they could un unmute themselves and ask their queries.
now there is no queries by the participants. I once again from the organizing team of EC, all of you team, thank you for sparing your valuable time in enlightening us with the detailed facts of patenting rights and enforcement rules. And thank you so much for sparing our time, sir. And once and once again, I also want to thank all the participants for giving your valuable time for making this second session of the first day workshop successful. Thank you so much. And I'll once again we welcome me tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for the second day of the workshop for the first session. So with the due permission of all the members, can we conclude the second session of the first day? Yes, ma'am, uh, I can, uh, can conclude now. Thank you so much. Have a very good day. Thank you.